open our Bibles back up to the book of Acts this morning, back to the book of Acts. And from what it looks like today, we're probably going to begin uh, a message that will take the best part of uh, three Sundays to complete. And uh, we're, we're going to delve into some things that, again, like we I know uh, I've said it earlier, that we have uh, already looked at over the years, but it's something that I would like for us to revisit. Uh, I taught on this a little bit by way of devotion when we were in Cyprus in the month of June. I uh, just sent a brief couple of devotions out while we were actually at Salamis. We went, Denise and I went to visit, as well as Paphos, which was a, a bucket list for me, uh, to, a point to tick off. It was such a blessing to be able to visit those areas and just think about the mighty work um, uh, that the Apostle Paul and, and Barnabas would have performed there. And, of course, my mind and my imagination begins to run wild and rampant when standing in an area uh, as that. But, but Acts, thir- Acts 13 is the next event in Paul's life after he had spent 14 years of preparation to fulfill the intention, if you will, or the purpose of our Lord uh, of bringing the light of the glorious gospel to all of mankind. Uh, to the regions beyond, if you will. It will be the beginning of mine and your uh, spiritual heritage, if you will. Uh, our time, our as Gentiles being saved and born again as a result of the mighty and wonderful work that begins right here in Acts chapter 13. And so we're going to look in the verse, uh, verses 1 through 13 uh, here today, give or take a little bit, uh, if, if you will. We're going to try to touch into a couple of other verses, but, but I'm not going to run so rampant today of trying to, to, uh, uh, to pack 20 pounds of sand, if you will, into a 10-pound bag. And uh, I want to cover the, the events and the lives uh, that, that, that places the order of the Bible. Everything that is taught about our living God in the Apostle Paul's life, we are, we are beginning to see things here in Acts 13 uh, in the Word of God that many have never seen before. And guys, it's more than just words on a page, if you will. It's a holy scripture. It's alive. It's a living description and map of a, of a life of, of one who will dedicate his or her living uh, to the risen Savior. And you're going to find what Paul experiences here in Acts 13 will be the very thing that anyone who commits himself to the work of God uh, will experience in their life. Read again with me in uh, chapter 13, and uh, we'll pick it up there where Paul and Barnabas are sent out. Uh, if you look there, and uh, just go ahead and look in verse 3. The Bible says, And when they had fasted and prayed uh, and laid uh, their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. When they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to the minister. And when they had gone through the isle of Paphos, uh, unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sir Gaius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name, um, so, so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is, is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And when then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company, loose from Pavis, they came to Perga and Pamphylia. John, departing from them, returned. To Jerusalem, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be here this morning. We pray that you'd bless the teaching and preaching of your words, that you would open up hearts and minds, dear God, to receive it with gladness. And Lord, I pray the one who needs most help today would receive that which they need, Lord, by the hand of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen and amen. Beloved, what we're looking at here today is the very beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. And 
It's, it's where he begins to, to fulfill his primary calling, if you will, and that's to take the gospel, guys, to the, to the regions beyond. And, and the pattern that Paul lives uh, within his life, within his days, matter of fact, the pattern Paul lives within this chapter is a pattern that he sets for the rest of his life. And when we begin to read through this chapter and we see all the things that happen, uh, that may not be too encouraging to some people. That may not be too encouraging to a lot of our life if we look and say, hey, this is the very beginning of his, of his mission journey, of his mission field of taking the gospel to the regions beyond. And all the things that begin to happen and seemingly happen like rapidly, we find if that's the pattern for the rest of his life, my soul, what is it going to be like? But beloved, almost everything we will face in the work of God is in this chapter. For those who will dedicate themselves to the work of the Lord, you're going to have foes to fight. You're going to have friends to flee. You're going to have furious findings. And, and beloved, you're going to hit that fatigue factor. I, I would love to tell you this morning that uh, the fatigue factor is not an issue. But I'm going to tell you right here by, by personal testimony, there will be infirmities that will be a direct result of the work of God. In the 14th verse here in the in the. In the, in the uh, in Acts 13, the Bible says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went in unto the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. Now the Bible tells me in Galatians 4, verse 13, that, that you know how through, how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the, at the first. Paul actually wore himself out, becoming deathly sick in his life, guys. And we especially see this in the, his second missionary journey. Deathly sick just because of the work of God. So in Acts chapter 13, in verse, uh, verses 6 through 13, we find uh, the very first day, if you will, of, a, of his journey. And, and with every forward movement of the gospel, uh, there's a degree of opposition that continues to grow. The book of Acts shows us what the ministry is up against as it moves throughout a lost and dying world. And that doesn't matter if it's a lost and dying world, a lost and dying continent, a lost and dying country, a lost and dying community, or down to the smallest little individual villages throughout our nations today. These are going to be some of the things that you're going to fight, that you're going to face when you sell out for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just the first day, guys, but it, and it doesn't get any easier for Paul, at least, at least not at the last, it doesn't. His ministry was to work, and Paul understood that. Paul understood that he was willing to labor and give up everything. In Acts 13, Paul faces a, a sorcerer. Later on, he faces a synagogue, and later on, he faces a stir. And, and, and we find all of these things happen just within one remarkable chapter. Now back to Paphos, guys. Paphos was at that time a city of Roman government. It was a city of deep moral decay. Sir Gaius is a representative of the government. And despite the faithlessness of the city, God still moved and wanted to change it. And that's one of the things I think that, that in the ministry, in, in, uh, whether it's pastoring or being a missionary or whether it's a church planner or an evangelist, it's very easy to get caught up with the events of the day with the demise of our society. I mean, guys, honestly, I, you're not look, I hope that you're not looking through life through, through rose-colored glasses and thinks that, that our society today is better than it was 50 years ago. Surely you don't think that our culture today is better than it was 100 years ago, because it's not, my friend. We live in a degradating society. We live in a society that is filled uh, with violence and it's filled with crime and it's filled with drug abuse and, and with chill, child abuse and molestation and all of the things that we live in today. And, and it's not a great society to live in. And we need to understand that. But here's the, here's the caveat. It's easy for the man of God. It's easy for the preacher of the word of God to begin to succumb to those events that are going on and step back and say, listen, God's just done with that place. If you would have looked at Paphos in, in Paul's day and would have seen the wickedness and the darkness and, and the, the vileness of that city, you would have found yourself probably saying the same thing. Here's a city where the government and religion were married, and that is never positive or beneficial or biblical. So you can imagine what kind of shape the people were in spiritually. A corrupt religion will undermine the faith, and it will tear down a country it will destroy a city. It will utterly break the foundation of a county. So, beloved, we need to understand that even though a society has gone away from God, 
even though a society predominantly denies God, like the land that we live in today, with over 55% of the people in our population throughout Great Britain, throughout the United Kingdom, I should say, do not believe that there is a God. Less than 1.5% attend church on Sunday. I don't even know what the, the percentages are for a midweek service. I would, rec- I would probably assume half of that, if, and that would be pushing it. People aren't faithful anymore. They're not committed and dedicated to the local church the way they should be. No. And they wonder why they struggle through life. They wonder why they don't grow spiritually. They wonder why they just can't get quite past some of the things that are still rearing their ugly head. Because you're not doing anything to get past it. Amen? I'm just going to go ahead and call it like it is this morning with that. But beloved, you would look at a society and you would say, man, God's done with that place. Paul didn't look at it like that. Paul stepped up into Paphos, and with all of its wickedness, and all of its idolatry, and all of its darkness, and all of its depression, hey, all of its desperation, if you will, Paul said, no, the Word of God needs to be preached here. Now, I want you to see some of the uniqueness of the writing here, if you will. Look in verse 6 with me. Verse 6 in Acts 13. Notice this with me, if you will, this morning. Verse 6 says, and when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found, watch this next few words, a certain... Sorcerer. Now, the word certain is used more times in the book of Acts than any other uh, part of the Bible. And Luke uses, matter of fact, uh, the word certain in his gospel and in the book of Acts more than any other uh, author that God used. He wrote it down. He wanted you and I, he wanted us to know exactly who he was speaking about, who, uh, who was involved in this, who was the cause, the root cause of the, of the, uh, of the darkness in this city, if you will. But he all, here's what I want you to understand. Luke wanted you to know and wanted me to know that this certainly happened. He left no room whatsoever for discussion or for debate on the matter. Matter of fact, there there are certain places in Luke's writing that he assumes for you, the reader, to know what he's talking about. Acts chapter 9, verses 20 through 22 is one of those things. He requires you to do a little bit of digging and reading to know what happens between verse 20 and verse 22. He requires you that. There are other places in the scripture where he leaves no room for discussion. He's like, you know what? I'm going to do the work for you. I'm going to make sure you clearly understand that there was a certain sorcerer. His name was Bar-Jesus. By the way, his name's not only Bar-Jesus by way of inter- uh, interpretation. His name is Elemis. You know what he did? He, he zeroed in exactly who this guy, he zeroed in on the criminal, if you will. And he says, I'm not going to leave any room for mistake here this morning. He wanted you to know that it certainly happened. Just like in the Old Testament, Rome, uh, we, we know that in Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter 13, um, sorry, Romans chapter 15, Paul says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Luke is telling us the very same thing. He's doing this for us. He's writing it for us here today, if you will, just like the Old Testament was written for Paul as he was preaching through the Scriptures, he's saying they're written for our learning so that you may know who's responsible. Now, in Paul's day, it was customary when a philosopher came into a city, he would find a place on a corner or a street and begin to perform all of his wisdom and his knowledge. Philosophy was a reigning, reigning, uh, which is the root of psychology, if you will, but it was a reigning type of religion. You know, I know people say, well, philosophy is not really a religion. Yes, it was. You go to Athens in Paul's day, the whole city was given wholly over to idolatry. That was all the idolatry of worshiping the philosophies and the philosophers themselves in ancient Greece in ancient uh, Athens. So I'm saying let to say this. After this very same custom, this Roman custom, this Grecian custom as well, uh, after Rome conquered Greece, we find that Paul would pick him a street corner, just happened to be in front of a governmental building. And instead of philosophizing, he, what did he do? He stood up and he preached. And a crowd began to perform, or uh, form. Verse 7 says, uh, which was uh, with the deputy of the country, Sir Gaius Paul, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. This crowd began to form and listen to the, the preaching of the gospel. And this governor, if you will, this deputy of the country, began to hear the word of God being preached down there on the street corner. And he desired, he goes, I want to hear more about that. And we're about to find two religions to collide. You know, guys, there's only two, two beliefs in this world today. There's only, 
There's only two of them. You say, oh, preacher, there's thousands upon millions of religions. No, there's a right one. There's a right ones. <laughs> I mean, a right one, and then there's wrong ones, plural. The, uh, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That's the right one, amen. That's the right direction. Any other avenue to, the, any other avenue to eternal life outside of Jesus Christ, whether it's through a woman, Mary, you're, Mary's not going to save you, all right? That's idolatry. Whether it's through wisdom, wisdom is not going to save you, amen? That's self-idolatry. Whether it's through works, works are not going to save you. Paul says that we are saved by grace through faith, amen? Saved by grace through faith and, and not of ourselves. Hey, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's one way, straight and narrow, amen? There's one way unto eternal life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anything add, added to that or taken away is pagan and satanic. There's only two ways, guys. There's only two religions in the world for all practicalities. Verse 6 through 10 is clear, very clear, that we find that a certain sorcerer is found in verse 6. Uh, the deputy calls for, calls for Paul and Barnabas to come up and, and speak to them this word. In the latter part of verse 8, it says that this Elemus, this sorcerer, is seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now, he's got all this control upon this city, and it starts from this, this head dog, this top dog, if you will, this uh, deputy of this city. And when Paul saw that he was seeking to do so, then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O child of, he says, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. That's not nice words, now is it? Yeah, but he says, you child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord, he says. Oh, we just won't. Why didn't he just go and say, let me just be friends with you. We'll have a little counseling session and, and let me just win you. No, Paul called him exactly what he was. And sometimes, guys, I'm just here to tell you this this morning. Sometimes you got to call it like it is. I heard a quote. I heard a, an interview by Nick Saban, greatest coach in American football history. I just happen to be an Alabama fan. and He just happens to be that coach. But nonetheless, he was talking about people wanting to succeed. And what it takes to succeed. And I don't remember the quote verbatim. But if you're going to succeed, he said, if you're going to do well, it just takes work. It is what it is, he says. You're not gonna, you know, we live in a world today filled with TikTok and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of these people that are self-proclaimed influencers and they're, they're occupying their time and your time and your mind and you want to become great and wonderful and all this and that, but you're not doing anything for it. Saban says it takes what it takes. Paul is doing the same thing. It, it, it is what it is, guys. You gotta, if, you're gonna, if you're going to be successful, it's going to require work. If someone is a pagan, if they're a God-hater, if they're an enemy unto, unto, uh, unto uh, all righteousness, if they will not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord, you call it like it is, let the dust settle. Hey, you let the other shoe fall and let the chips fall where they may, amen. They'll either receive it or reject it. That's not up to you. Call it like it is. Paul did. So I want you to see what happens here. Two religions are going to collide in this castle, and Paul and Barnabas are called before the deputy. And I want you to see all in one room. You got Sir Gaius Paulus, you got a sorcerer, Saul and Barnabas, Spirit of God, and you got Satan. That's what you have. First thing I want us to look at, maybe the only thing we look at today, is I want us to look at this deputy this morning. Look at this Sir Gaius Paulus here in verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7, I know we're rereading several times, but which was, of the, which was with the deputy of the, con the country, Sir Gaius Paulus, a prudent man uh, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Guys, you know what Luke calls him? This is what, I, again, I love about Luke's writing. Again, it's, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Luke did not have a choice. God still used the character of these authors uh, to pen these words. Luke didn't call him, uh, he didn't call him ignorant. He didn't call him dumb. You know what he said, guys? He goes, you know, he's a smart man. He said he's prudent, man. He calls him prudent. You say, well, Matt, hang on a second. What in the world does that mean? Do a little turning with me, if you will. And let's go to Proverbs in chapter 13. This is the character, if you will, of Sir Gaius. Uh, you know, we, we have a tendency to, to d distrust government leaders. And guys, I fully understand, trust me, especially with all that's going on in the world today. But Paul took, Paul, Paul uh, went in, and to preach the word of God. This man wanted to hear it. He was being blinded by his uh, advisor, if you will. Proverbs 13, Proverbs chapter 13. I'm just going to put them all up there real quick, I think. 
and uh, we'll, we'll turn as we can. Proverbs 13, verse 16. Notice what the Bible says. It says, every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. So, so Luke says, he says, this man here, this man, this deputy, this guy is Paul, is, is a prudent man. What does he do? He's dealing with things with knowledge. Does that not speak very, um, I don't want to use the word strongly, but uh, it, does, it, sp- it speaks strongly of his character of calling Paul and Barnabas up there, doesn't it? He wanted to hear more. Rather than just, quick, that's something new, let me just rule it out. Rather than asking someone else, he went to the root of the words. He says, call these preacher boys up here. I want to hear what he's got to say. Look in Proverbs 14, verses 15, and then we'll look at verse 18. Proverbs 14, just one chapter over, verse 15 says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his goings. Look at verse 18. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. You know what he's, you know what he's doing? He said, I want to learn more about this. I want to hear more about, I'm not just going to rule it out. I'm not just going to, you know, ignore it. I'm not just going to continue going because of ease. I'm not going to listen to this guy who's kept me blind the whole time. I want to hear more about what these guys are saying. Look over in chapter 16. What is prudent? The Bible says here, it says, The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. He wanted to know more. He wanted to know more, guys. Proverbs 18, verse 15 says, The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. So prudence and wisdom, guys, are associated with prudence. A prudent man, knowledge without the Spirit of God is a very dangerous, dangerous thing. But this man wanted to know more. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you this right now. I know he was, a lo- he was lost as a day as long at this present moment. But I will tell you this here uh, this morning, if, uh, if you'll get a hold of this quick thought with me today, I want you to understand that if you're going to grow in grace, the Bible says growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to grow in grace if you don't grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ if you're not committed to the local church, if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not studying and praying. You're not going to. It's impossible. But this man called them up. He wanted to know more. Not only was he a prudent man, uh, he, was, he, was a political, he was a political man. We, we see that. He was under the influence of the devil. He was the representative of the Roman government, and, and therefore he was under uh, the influence of Satan, if you will. And the devil will always talk out of both sides of his mouth. And we know that Tiberius Caesar kept sorcerers around him constantly. I mean, it, I mean, it probably would amaze you what's going, in, uh, going on in some, of our, uh, in some of our cities, in our world today, in our governmental leaders, but we'll leave that one where it is. We saw the same thing with Nebuchadnezzar. He, he surrounded himself with these so-called wise men, but there was no spirit of God in them until Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and those guys came in there, and he saw the prudence of these men. He saw the diligence, the dedication. He saw that God was with them. And then he sees, again, proven when he throws the three Hebrew boys in Daniel 3 down in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar himself testified it in the form of the fourth was like the Son of God. Amen? If you've got a book that says one of the sons of God, and he'd throw it in the waste bin because it's rubbish. Amen? The Bible says the one had the form, amen, the image of the Son of God. There's only one, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find here that he's a prudent man. He's a smart man, if you will. He was filled with superstition as well. Now, we're not going to rule that. You can't throw it out. Luke begins to reveal to us how weak the wisdom of the world really and truly is. He, com- he, com- you know, uh, he commends, he does commend Sir Gaius' intelligence. I don't want to take that away. Don't, don't, don't ignore that, okay? But he also condemns his weakness in the Spirit of God. Intelligence and knowledge do not guard you from the snare of the devil. You can be the most in- intellect- intelligent person on the face of the planet and still be on the road to a devil's hell and still be deceived. You know, I find it, I find it comical how... Calvinists pride themselves as being, as being uh, you know, intellects. All they do is sit in a room and write. They never witness, they never do this, they never share the gospel, the word of God, of which we're commanded to, uh, well in the, num- the, the number of hundreds of times uh, throughout the scripture. And yet, these people have bought into a false doctrine and consider themselves to be intelligent. God, listen, you know, yeah, Sir Gaius was smart enough, but he, he had no spirit of God with him, and that's a dangerous thing. 
Very superstitious he was. Look, look in 2 Corinthians 2. Let me show you this here. Luke begins to unfold in the book of Acts, and we see that, that Paul makes a, a clear distinction uh, concerning uh, this, what, what superstition, if you will, intelligence and knowledge, uh, but yet the snare of the devil being caught up. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and you're looking in verse 11. The Bible says, Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, guys, ignorance is not stupidity. All right. I don't want you to, to walk out of here today and think just because you are without the knowledge of something that makes you uh, unable to learn. That's far from the truth. Don't ever buy into that, okay? Ignorance just simply means the lack of knowledge. Without knowledge is what ignorance means. So I'm, having, I'm saying that to this point right here. Paul makes it clear. We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. We know what he does. As a matter of fact, we know there's only three categories of sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John covers that in his first epistle. Uh, God covers that in the book of Genesis chapter 3. The very three things that he tempted Eve with at the tree are the same three categories of sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So we're not ignorant of his devices. We know what he's doing. We know what he does, but we got to remove ourselves from superstition and hold ourselves to the validity of the Word of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 22, the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So guys, we can't get caught up into the wisdom and the ways of this world and then get caught into the snare and the trap of the devil. We look at salvation, though. Here's a beautiful part of it. He desired to hear the Word of God. We see that in verse 12. He desired to hear... You know, the Word of God, and I want to stop there. just want to make a quick little point. Beloved, having a desire to hear the Word of God, I, and my, this, I'm going to give you my I rarely do this, but I'm going to give you my opinion. I think it's an earmark of a sweet spirit. Convicted, yes. Conviction sets in, absolutely. Fear sets in, most certainly. We see that with Felix and Agrippa. Having that desire to hear, he heard something that spoke to his heart. He heard something as those men were down there preaching the Word of God. And he says, I want to know more. Again, speaking to his prudence, but bringing him also to salvation. Verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. But what did he believe, guys? He believed. He was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Not Paul's doctrine. Not a denomination. Not Barnabas' doctrine, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is that? The same gospel Paul says he preached in 1 Corinthians 15, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel, my friend. So we find that, our, that, that it was out of judgment Sir Gaius was saved. It wasn't sweet little candy-coated words telling him how good he was. Jude tells us, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Sir Gaius heard the word of God, and then he saw the judgment of God, and conviction set in with fear, and therefore he was saved. You see, beloved, the church of Antioch sent out their two best men, and therefore the, churches, the church will get the reward of the word of God being magnified here in Cyprus and then, of course, in the regions beyond. But the beautiful example that we find here uh, in salvation with Sir Gaius is a, is a beautiful example that we find throughout Paul's mission's journey. Acts 19 is a beautiful picture. I'm just going to read it to you for time's sake. And it says, And this was known uh, to all the Jews and Greeks um, also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was magnified. Who was magnified this day in Paphos? It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Barnabas. It was the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching and teaching of his word. And that's what made the difference, not only in the day and even the season with, um, with the sorcerer, but made a difference for the, the eternal destination of a soul. And guys, let's just be honest with one another. At the end of the day, that's what really matters. What really matters today is the difference that we're going to make in eternity for people. We didn't get into uh, to half of what I wanted to get into this morning. and I'm going to stop here with just some guys. We'll get into the sorcerer next week and hopefully a little further. But I want to just encourage you this morning. Not only should you read and study Acts 13, not only are you going to find that everything in the ministry is the, in the work of God, and, and whether it be a preacher, a pastor, whether it be a, a, a member, church member in a pew, if you're going to do a work for the Lord today, which we all are commanded and called to do so, we're all commanded to soul win. 
We're all commanded to share the gospel with the lost and dying in this world. If you're sat here today in this pew and you were saved and you were born again, you were saved and born again by way of one or two things, one or a few things. Number one, you read the word of God for yourself. The Holy Spirit of God convicted you and you got saved. Number two, you heard the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit convicted you. You believed on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got saved. Number three, someone cared about you enough to share the gospel with you. And you believed on that death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you got saved. Either which way about it, either one of those three right there today, it all goes back to someone caring enough to share the gospel in the world. For us, guys, you say, well, you know what? I read the Bible and I got saved. Okay, praise the Lord for that. Do you know what? You have that Bible in your hands today because the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's a spoken, preserved, purified uh, word of God. And there's 14 of those books that are written in that New Testament by the Apostle Paul because he cared enough to obey the Lord and go to the regions beyond so that the gospel would be heard, heard by a lost and dying people. So it all goes back to someone sharing the precious gospel. It all goes back to someone being obedient enough to share the gospel with someone else. And that's why each and every one of us, and that's how each and every one of us are saved. You wasn't chosen, chosen, frozen. You wasn't uh, destined to be saved and you had no will of it. You could have denied it. You could have taken that conviction and you could have said, nope, not going to do it. There's countless people that I can take you. I can take you to the scriptures, show you multiple examples of those who were convicted even trembling in fear, and said, no, when I have a convenient season, I'll come to you. Almost thou persuadest me. Happens, over, happens every single day. You probably witnessed to people, and they've said, not right now. Go away. Things like that. At the end of the day, guys, it's love and it's compassion for the lost and dying souls today that brings a person to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's only going to be through the obedience of us today to look into Acts 13, see what Paul was willing to do by being obedient to the calling of the Holy Spirit of God to take the gospel to the regions beyond. The very doctrine that was taught in Antioch, Syria, Acts chapter 11, where, these, where the disciples, okay, they were already saved, born again, where the disciples were first called Christians. That very doctrine that Paul and Barnabas taught for a year's time landed here and it can date back right here in the area that we stand right now, to AD 63. Paul wasn't killed by the Roman government uh, on the road to Ostia for five years after that. You say, well, preacher, how in the world did they get here? I don't know. I don't know how. Somebody got on a ship and came through, these, came through uh, uh, this land, and they preached the gospel. That's how it got here. They cared enough to bring the gospel. We can date it all the way back to AD 63, right here where we stand this morning. My question to you this morning is going to be this. I know the gospel has gone to the regions beyond. I know the Apostle Paul was called to that particular unique ministry, and he was the first one that that mystery that the Gentiles should be saved, just like uh, the Jews were, they'd be saved according to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That mystery was shrouded to everyone until the Apostle Paul. I understand that. I get that. But my question and challenge to us this morning, are we going to continue to see that the gospel is shed to the regions beyond? Are we willing today to share the gospel with those that we love so much? Say we love them so much. It's easy to assume that our loved ones are quote-unquote saved. Very easy to do that. But I wouldn't assume anything in today's world. I wouldn't assume anything in the life that we have in this world today. The Bible says that evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I'm not calling your family or your friends evil. I'm calling, I am just calling the fact that they may be being deceived by an evil man. So, beloved, if you say you love someone, if you truly in, in all of your heart and your mind love someone, enjoy the time you have with them, but whatever you do, be willing to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with them so that they may be saved, gloriously saved for all eternity by the Holy Spirit of God. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be here today. We ask of you, Lord, to please uh, take your message. Lord, just ignore the messenger, but I, I pray to you take your message. Write it upon the table of our hearts. Encourage us, Father. Motivate us 
I pray that we're challenged today to put away our own ideologies, our own assumptions. I pray we're challenged today to speak to that one that we love so dear about the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope and my prayer and my desire is that they would receive salvation in the manner that it has been given. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do hope and pray the sermon you just heard was a tender blessing to your heart and to your soul. I hope that it gives you the encouragement, edification, to face the challenges that we see each and every day and week throughout our life. I'd like to invite you out to one of our live services here at Saren Chapel in Abraman. We are located on Lewis Street as well as Davis Street. Davis Street is the entrance to our chapel and as well as Lewis Street is the entrance to our hall and you can use either one of them. But secondly today, guys, I would like to share just a brief message to you now to ask you to where you are going in eternity. If today was the last day you were alive, if today by some tragedy, this was the last moment you had on this earth, when you closed your eyes, would you wake up and see Jesus Christ? It is a simple question, guys, and it is even a more simple answer. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, paid the ultimate price for mankind. He gave us the free pass to eternal life by giving his life on the cross of Calvary, being buried into that grave, but rising again on the third day. It is simple as this. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, guys, while we were sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us so much that he gave his life. As a matter of fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sin is defined as the transgression of God's law. But what happened was the payment for mankind is death. Romans 6.23 clearly tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask you today, what what would stop you right here, right now, from bowing your head and saying a prayer much like this, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you stepped up out of the grave to give us victory over sin and victory over death. I invite you into my heart and ask forgiveness of my sins and ask you to lead God and direct me throughout the rest of my life. Now, here's the thing. You say that prayer in your own words, but you have to say it and believe in it. Remember, Romans 10, 9 says, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is a promise from the word of God. That is a promise from God himself. That is the promise from the creator of all things, that if you'll believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, ask forgiveness of your sins, accept his free gift and pardon of sin into your heart today, that you will be born again, that you will have eternal life in heaven. Guys, I hope and pray this is a blessing to you today. I hope and pray that you make that decision. And if you have, if you've made that decision today, let us rejoice with you. Come by and see us here at the church or hit us up online at any of the social media outlets or through email or however you can. Just share with us the glorious transformation that you just received in your life. Guys, I hope to see you soon in the house of God. I hope to see you soon right here in Sharon Chapel. And may the Lord be with each and every one of you. God bless.